You'll notice uh, no slides. I really am doing this extemporaneously, and it's mostly because I'm not particularly enlightening. Um, I'm almost always entertaining, so I'm, that's my goal today. Um, if you read the agenda, you'll see that Dean said I've been doing this for decades. Decades is 15 years. That in Dean speak, uh, 15 years is decades. I'm hopeful that I make it to my second decade. Um, I'm a stock market analyst, which means that I help investors figure out stocks. So Electronic Arts is a stock I cover it. I cover Amazon. And I help investors figure out what those companies are going to earn. In order to do that, I make a lot of assumptions about what they're going to, to sell in order to generate revenue. And so I look at games and figure out how a game's going to sell. I cover Nintendo. I figure out what Pokemon Go revenues are going to be in the first year. And then I figure out what percentage of Niantic Nintendo owns and what percentage of the Pokemon company they own and try to figure out what that means. And I am always wrong. I, I honest to God, have gotten one estimate right in my life. I, I literally forecast once in 2002 that Spider-Man would sell 1.75 million units and Bobby Kotick asked me who at Activision leaked that number to me because it was spot on. Um, and just again, to, to tell you how perfect I am at this, I forecast that Grand Theft Auto 3 would sell 325,000 units. So in, in case you're unfamiliar with order of magnitude, it's order of magnitude times two. I missed by, I don't know, 30 million units. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you what's going to happen. I'm gonna tell you how I think about the world and how I see the future of, of the industry. And in order to uh, talk about the future, we have to talk about the past. I think that it's helpful just to think about how we all started playing games, and I mean video games. Um, and most of us started in arcade. I mean, some of you who are older probably had a, a work PC or, or a dumb terminal and you were able to play like Lunar Lander. Some of you probably started on, a, on an HP 12C or something playing you know, some kind of a space you know, lander, allocating your fuel. But games became popular uh, initially in the arcade. And, you know, it was the, the Ataris of the world that came up with Pong and they had the coin-op arcade and Midway and Nintendo. And those guys thought, gosh, we're building this hardware. People have to come to us. Let's figure out a way to distribute the hardware in the home. So, so somebody, you know, Coleco or Intellivision or Nintendo came up with a console, Atari, and the home console worked. And, and what was the console? A monitor, a joystick, a CPU and GPU, except that instead of being in an arcade, the CPU and GPU were in a box, the joystick was hardwired, and you used your TV monitor as your monitor. Okay, great, so now we have the hardware, home consoles took off, rest is history, right? And the biggest change, I think, in console gaming happened in 2001. By design, it just didn't work, which was the Xbox. And the Xbox came out, Dean wrote a book on it, Bill Gates said, I'm gonna make this box the entertainment hub in the living room. Now, Bill Gates was thinking, you're gonna flow movies through your Xbox, because obviously nobody thought about the smart TV at that time. Nobody thought you could stream a movie to your phone. I mean, of course not. So the Xbox was gonna do that. And then a bunch of game makers, and I would say, let's, let's start with Valve, with Counter-Strike, said, hey, we can play multiplayer on this thing. So Halo multiplayer, now we've got, I saw Condry in the audience someplace, Call of Duty multiplayer, and suddenly this whole industry was born, people playing games everywhere. So what's the limitation of the console? The limitation is maybe if you count all legacy consoles and current gen consoles, there's 300 million households out there that play. And yet you heard Dean talk about the $99 billion industry. I don't know where that number comes from, but it's a lot of billions of dollars. It's mostly mobile, desktop free to play, tablet games, obviously some console games, lots and lots of PC games. But what made the industry go from, at its peak, a $22 billion console and PC market to a $99 billion mobile, tablet, console, free to play, PC market? And the answer is taking that CPU, GPU that used to be in your arcade machine and putting it in here. And it really is that simple. And I mean, I know a lot of you guys played jammed at bowling on your feature phone where you go back and forth and pick the lane, but 
we're suddenly able to play real games on this thing. And so Dean, again, talked about Pokemon Go. And what's the innovation in Pokemon Go? GPS, oh my God, AR. Like, how cool is that? It's not that clever a game if you look at it. It's kind of a simple, dopey game. But it got people up off their butts and out and checking things out. So where is the world going? Where is the industry going? Um, I think that's a tough question because typically content drives adoption. So movie content, finding different windows to deliver movies beyond the theater, you got more people watching movies. When movies are shown on TV, more people watch them. When we got services like HBO, more people watch them. When we have services like Netflix, more people watch movies. Same content. Unfortunately, that's not what's going on with games. So just because I have a CPU, GPU in my phone, I'm not playing Call of Duty on my phone. And, and my question is, why not? And the answer is because the GPU is not there yet. The answer is because the screen's too small. So I think the future of games is somebody's going to connect that CPU, GPU in your pocket to your television. And I'll tell you, the first guys who are going to try it are Nintendo with the NX, and it's probably not gonna work, but they're gonna try, and God bless them for trying. And the, the rumor on the NX is, it's a handheld device that sits in a docking station, connects to your TV, and you can play games on your TV with a regular controller, or take the handheld with you. That's pretty innovative, and I think that's where we're headed. So, real question is, as you think about the future of games, what happens when you go from 300 million people who can play console quality games to two and a half billion people who can play console quality games. What happens to the industry then? And the answer is, you're gonna sell two to 10 times as many copies of your game if you can make it available and make it work. What are the obstacles? Clearly, technology is an obstacle. You've got to have a CPU and a GPU fast enough in whatever device you choose to, to stream the game to or download the game to. You have to have enough storage if you're gonna download the game. I have 128 gigs in my two-year-old iPhone. I'm guessing that they'll have 512 gigs in a matter of you know, three or four or five years. So that shouldn't be an obstacle. A, an NVIDIA you know, fast graphics card is a couple of hundred bucks. It's obviously not Oculus ready, but a, a 970 or something, a couple hundred bucks. It's gonna probably be 25 bucks in five or 10 years. And so the question really is, will console gaming advance so much that that type of experience will be considered to be poor? I don't think so. I think that if you can deliver 60 frames a second at 1080p from a phone, that's good enough for most people. And especially if you can do it and you require no additional hardware, all you need is a Fire TV stick and an aftermarket controller and you're playing the game. So technologically, I don't think that we're gonna see much of an obstacle Certainly not within the next 10 years, it's gonna happen. The second obstacle, multiplayer. How do we play multiplayer? Well, Microsoft said, we're gonna provide it on the Xbox, and we're gonna charge you 60 bucks a year for the privilege of playing multiplayer on your Xbox. And Sony said, no, we're gonna do it free. For some odd reason, free didn't work. So Sony started charging 50 bucks, and it works. Microsoft just started something called Xbox Anywhere. They announced at E3, and they said, you can take your Xbox game and we'll have a copy waiting for you on your Windows 10 PC. And if you save it, if you're playing Gears of War and you're at level 17, when you pick it up on your PC, you'll be at level 17. And we're gonna give you a Bluetooth controller that'll work with both. Why are they doing that? Because they're really trying to protect the Xbox Live business. They're saying, ultimately, we know all games are going off console. In Microsoft's case, they hope it's a Windows 10 based PC experience. But as far as Apple's concerned, it should be iOS. As far as Amazon and Google are concerned, it should be Android. It doesn't really matter. It's going to move off console. And Microsoft said, we want to protect the 35 million people who are currently paying us 60 bucks a year, $2 billion a year in Xbox Live fees. We want to make sure we own that. All right, so we know Microsoft will offer it. Question is, will Amazon offer it? Will Sony offer it? Will Apple offer it? Will Activision offer it directly? I think the answer to all of those questions is yes. So then what? Then what are the impediments? Cross-platform play, 
can you have it if everybody's playing on a PC? Do I have to sign up for the Apple network if I want to play a friend on the Microsoft network? Well, if I have a Sprint phone, can I talk to one of you on your Verizon phone? Yeah, somebody's going to figure this out. And the answer is, I believe, multiplayer is going to evolve the way uh, mobile carriers have evolved, where the carriers don't really make that much money, but they make up for, uh, per, per account, but they make up for it in volume. Somebody is going to be, you know, Switzerland here. Somebody's going to figure it out. If I have to call out a company that I think has the balance sheet, uh, the leadership, and the desire, it's probably Amazon. We'll probably figure this out. Um, the problem with Amazon pulling it off is Microsoft's in the way, and they're not, you know, pikers. They're going to they're going to fight. Um, and so I think it's going to come down to a provider coming up with a solution that works and not charging very much. Or, more importantly, they maybe can charge 50 or 60 bucks a year, cutting the content owner in on a piece of that, which Microsoft currently doesn't do, um, Sony currently doesn't do. So my vision of the future is that you're going to be able to reach everybody who has a CPU, GPU, whether it's a laptop, tablet, PC, phone, and as long as they have a monitor and they're willing to spend you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks on an aftermarket controller, you're going to be able to reach them with games. What's that mean for the industry? That means we're going to see games that are as silly as Flappy Birds all the way up to games that are as rich as The Last of Us or Uncharted, and you're going to be able to reach as many people with an Uncharted as you can with Flappy Birds. All right, so on the content side, What's the impediment to this working? And here's the rub. If you think about video content, about media, you know, televised media as a proxy, there aren't that many people who are really good at making movies and are really good at making TV. And there are certainly not that many people who are really good at making TV who make good YouTube videos. They're different types of creators. And why? Because a movie, a couple of hours, rich story, it ends, you're done. TV series can go on for six years or eight years, Breaking Bad or Walking Dead. And so it's a different type. The serialized drama is kind of a different type of experience. That's what's going on in mobile right now. We have serialized drama analogy, you know, where you get people to come back every day and keep playing. And with a game, with a console game, you tend to have an experience that has a start and an end. Now I get it, multiplayer keeps going, you keep doing map packs and stuff. But honestly, even if you look at Call of Duty, um, there aren't that many people who are still playing Call of Duty from five years ago. Um, you know, I, I understand that you know, Black Ops 2 had an audience because Ghost was a pretty poorly reviewed game, but that's the exception, not the rule. Uh, Michael might know how many people are playing Advanced Warfare right now, but once Black Ops 3 came out, most of the guys who are playing Advanced Warfare you know, switched over. So console games aren't in the business of keeping you forever. Mobile games are. And I, I have questions personally about Pokemon Go because I don't, I think once you find the 250 Pokemon and maybe they, they put in another 250 or 300, then what? You know, the Pokemon company is not gonna make 5,000 Pokemon for that game. So I think the real issue is content that comes from another medium has historically not done well on mobile. Mobile games tend to be ground up, built just for mobile, and the reason is you're not constrained by any realities in the game. So if I'm playing a Star Wars mobile game, I, can't I can take on a guy with a boulder with my laser light sword, and who cares? I'm gonna cut the boulder in half. Well, that doesn't make it very fun because everybody wants to be a Jedi Knight. Nobody wants to be the, the giant with the boulder. So when you play Clash of Clans, they can make everything work out. They can balance the economy so you can play any character class. That's how they built Hearthstone. That's how they build most free-to-play games. So again, I think we're gonna still have a very robust free-to-play market. I think free-to-play is training wheels for people who ultimately grow up to be console gamers. And if you guys think about it, as I said, your first game was probably an arcade game. Most of us played Space Invaders or Pac-Man, if you're you know, over 35, before we played Call of Duty. And you know, I used to say 10 years ago when I started, nobody was born and Call of Duty was the first game they played. That's not true anymore. 
Now there are six-year-olds playing Call of Duty. But the point is, we all grew up on more rudimentary games. I, I saw a stat back in the 80s that 400 people on the planet had played Solitaire on a PC. And that was the most popular game of all time back in the 80s. So, you know, the simpler the game, the easier to reach the audience, obviously, but it's a different skill set. And so what I think you're going to see as we expand the market beyond the console market for, you know, compelling AAA, $80 million budget games, I think you're going to see sales triple. I think you're going to see the rich get a lot richer. I think they're going to invest more and more and more in game success. I think the multiplayer market becomes a huge opportunity. And just like my cell phone, um, I paid about 150 bucks a month in 1991 when I got a cell phone and I had 30 minutes of talk time. I pay 118 now for four of them with unlimited talk text, 40 gigs of data. Um, so, you know, we're paying a lot less, but the opportunity is much bigger because there are two, two billion cell phones out there. And back when I had one in 91, there were five million cell phones out there. I think it's going to be the same thing. I think multiplayer will probably drop to two or three bucks a month. You will have, instead of 50 or 60 million people playing console multiplayer, you'll have probably 200 or 300 million people. So lots and lots of money. And that's going to drive appetite for uh, much deeper game penetration. I'm less than a minute. They said I could take a question if there, if there is one, but if not, I'm happy to say sayonara. Thank you.